right, we've got a stellar panel. Uh, we've got a stellar lineup for our panel today. Um, we've got Alison Johnson, Global Head of Customer Marketing at Okta. Woo! We've got Joshua Zerkel, Head of Engagement Marketing at Asana. Jamie. And Andrea Silva, Customer Advocacy Manager at Ultrix. Yeah. All right, so I'd like you guys to tell us a little bit about your journey. And Alison, if you can start off telling us a little bit about how you got to your uh, amazing role. Yeah, absolutely. So Alison Johnson, great to meet you guys. I have the privilege of leading Okta's global customer marketing team. And prior to that, uh, I was at Salesforce, small, small little company, where I was just telling Joshua, when I started there, I was the third employee to work on the customer marketing team. It's now like over 100. It's a huge, amazing, inspiring team. So it was a really great opportunity to grow and learn. And while I was there, I was on customer marketing. And then I also briefly did product marketing and was able to bridge the two. And then prior to that, I won't go into the whole career, it's a little, a little bit longer than I'd like to <laughs> admit to, because obviously I look like I'm in my 20s. But um, I've, been, I've been in a variety of roles in like product marketing and corporate marketing. And I will say, like I worked at uh, Cisco Systems a, long, a while ago, and I worked on our community and our social media, and I've just really found myself in really amazing opportunities where I'm kind of at like, the cutting edge of marketing. So like when I think of customer marketing now, and I think about when I was in college and the courses I was taking, nothing prepared me for the role I have today, because it didn't exist. And so I've just been really lucky in the sense of like signing up, raising my hand, being in opportunities where I can learn something new about the marketing landscape and world. And that's just kind of opened doors for me to be in the position where I am today in leading our customer marketing team. Amazing, <laughs> amazing story. <laughs> And Josh, I'd like to hear a little bit more, more about your journey and also maybe a little bit around how Asana thinks about uh, communities. Sure. Thanks, Steve. Hi, everybody. I'm Josh. I work at Asana. How many of you are familiar with Asana? Yeah. Then my team is doing our job really well. OK, great. <laughs> Bonus for me. So I lead a community at Asana. And what that means essentially is we build programs to reflect the love that our customers have for Asana and turn that into actionable business outcomes and insights. And so that takes the flavor of a variety of things. We have a really expansive community program. So it includes standard things like a community forum, although I sit within marketing, so we look at the forum as a channel. And then it includes our ambassador program, which is our network of super advocates, and our community events, which this year we're hosting around 80 to 100. In years past, in pre-COVID days, when we were even scrappier, we actually did 200 events a year for a team of four people. So we were like hustling really hard. Prior to Asana, I led community at Evernote, which was another big brand at the time. Uh, different in scale because that was more B2C, Asana is more B2B. That community we had 200 million people in. So when we talk about community, it's one of these levers that you can really use to scale the impact that all the rest of your marketing work is having. And I'll talk more about how you can do the customer marketing and advocacy thing as an outcome of community. Uh, prior to that, I was leading community at nonprofits, and I also did consulting in the world of productivity and organization. So I, too, am not in my 20s, although maybe I look it, maybe you I don't, you depending do. on how yeah. far away you yeah. are. Yeah. Here, drink <laughs> this. Yes. <laughs> awesome. And Andreas, I'd love to hear more about uh, your journey and also a little bit about how um, customer marketing is set up at Ultrix. Yeah. So. I know most of us in the room have I mean, kind of fell into it one way or another. I was fortunate enough not too long out of university. I was you know, looking for a job, knew someone through college, and they were at a little agency called Referential. And I said, hey, um, you know, he actually reached out to me and said, hey, you know, we're, we're hiring. We're doing this thing called a customer advocacy. I'm like, eh, that, that sounds cool. I don't know what that is, but yeah, sure, let's do that. Um, little did I know at the time, it was actually one of the best decisions I made because then I got to work under Helen Fieber for a few years. So those of you who know her, um, yeah, it was an uh, incredible experience. From there, um, decided to go out, um, do some in-house work. So worked at Automation Anywhere for uh, about a year, um, helping build up their customer advocacy program. Then went and did some customer marketing with Dialpad and um, a little over a year ago, a role or a position opened up with Alltricks with Luis Gonzalez, if, uh, if you know him. So I said, yep, I'm going to go work with that guy. Um, so Alltricks, we are a 
uh, data and analytics software company. Um, the way we're set up, we are part of the customer engagement team within marketing. So we are kind of a kind of a trident team. So one uh, one of us is we are customer advocacy, uh, lifecycle marketing, and then um, executive strategic program. So that includes our cab and other uh, executive events. Awesome, thank you. And uh, hi everyone, I'm Steve. I'm the CEO of Distillery. We're a global content company and we're incredibly passionate about creating amazing customer marketing content. And we have the pleasure of working with uh, Okta uh, and Alison. Yeah. But today we're here to talk about trust and how brands can effectively create genuine trust. And I'm going to start off by throwing to you, Alison, because surely trust and identity go hand in hand. Yeah. <laughs> so Okta, we focus on identity that belongs to you. So it is very important for us as, as we um, invest in our product to make sure that we are establishing that connection with our customers and putting them forward. So when it comes to customer marketing, we definitely want to live by our values and um, instill that trust in our customers. So it starts with our brand and our CEO and our leadership and then it trickles down into everything that we do. And so for customer marketing, it's so critical that we are building that connection with our customers in an authentic way. So one of the challenges with customer marketing is at times you're being asked to connect dots for different teams to maybe drive an output like a deal acceleration or a product feedback. And you have to find a way to do it in a really authentic way that connects with your brand and connects with your customers. Um, but also drives results, those KPIs that we talk about in customer marketing. It's not just fun and games, but you have to drive results. You want to build your team, you want to build your programs, and it takes um, money to write an investment to really be able to support your customers. So for us, it's been uh, a very fun journey of bringing together our stakeholders and speaking the same language. So we acquired another company a couple years ago, Auth0, with Okta, and we've been building out the, the customer marketing journey and bringing those brands together and trying to create a world where our customers don't have to suffer because of the internal politics of bringing two brands together. So we're focused a lot on building trust. We think about it. It's our company goal and, and our values, um, and it trickles into everything that we do, and we have to do it in a really integrated, strategic way that requires just a lot of... Um, authentic conversations and, and tough conversations at times. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And Josh, from your point of view, how does trust play into community? For me, I think trust is the foundation of community. Without it, you can't have the type of authentic conversations that happen at the community level. I think within brands, we think about our customers, not necessarily that there is a human there, but can we get the logo? Can we get a voice from the logo? Well, the voice behind the logo is an actual person, as it turns out. And so in order to facilitate those sorts of person-to-person -person connections, community helps make all of that happen by having different channels for different altitudes of customers. So for example, within Asana's community, there's a track for execs and VPs, but then there's everyone else, people who actually use the product, not just make the decisions based on it. We have to make sure that we provide avenues for all of those people to connect with each other, and importantly, with us. When they connect with us, that's when they get to appear behind the curtain, meet the people who are behind the product, and really understand the decisions that we make and why, they make, why we make them. So for instance, when we have a product launch, we have one of our PMs, and sometimes even the developers working on the product, come and speak at our community webinar so that people can learn what's happening, why we make decisions, rather than, here's a new product, here you go. They feel more included in the process, and that really lends to the authenticity that you were talking about, which then is germane to trust. Amazing, and what about from your point of view, Andreas? I, I mean, Josh nailed it on the head. It's, it's understanding that, you know, not, a lot of times we fall into the trap of, just going straight for the kill and wanting that logo, wanting that case study, wanting that public facing material, but not everybody wants that. Not, you know, not everybody wants to be on a stage, not everybody wants to be documented. So, you know, we partner with, um, you know, Jenna, you were talking about, uh, you know, partnering with uh, getting that product feedback. So we do a similar thing where um, we partner with our marketing team, you know, develop focus, uh, focus groups where they can provide that, um, that feedback on our go-to-market messaging, but it's in a private manner, or same thing with uh, product surveys, right? So you just getting, a, and that's why I like to 
actually get on a call with the advocate um, just so I can kind of get a feel for their personality, kind of get a, a feel for what they want to do. Um, and if they have a more vibrant personality, you know, a more, they're a little bit more articulate and very eloquent, I, I, that's the kind of person I say, yeah, you, you absolutely belong on stage. But, um, you know, for, we're talking about data scientists, right? So not all of them are going to be uh, that extroverted. So I do kind of take a step back and say, hey, you know, let's, let's bring you in. Let's, uh, let's have you take, uh, take part in like some beta tests and, you know, give that product feedback. And bu building on that, in terms of great customer content and building trust through customer stories, we, when we were talking earlier over a coffee, Andreas, you had a great anecdote about um, leveraging customer stories internally and making customers look good. Yeah, um, the best example I can give around that is um, if you all are familiar with uh, JLL, you know, commercial real estate, um, we have a lot of great advocates there. And although, you know, on, they have like a, you know, like a no endorsement policy, right? But what we do is we work with them and we have done videos with them. We've done um, blogs with them on their internal training programs. Um, the videos talk about how they've built a, a data centric culture. And while they're not necessarily talking about Alteryx, the product, and oh, we, we love Alteryx and this is what it does for us, it positions them as a data leader. And so other people come in and they know JLL. They're like, oh yeah, those folks, like their data team is incredible. Um, and it's a great recruiting tool for them. They've picked up a lot of analysts. Uh, some of our own advocates have jumped ship and joined their team. So it, you know, it becomes a great recruiting tool for them. So basically you're helping people get jobs. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't know it, but yeah. <laughs> Love it. And Josh, what about from your point of view in terms of, you know, community building? I mean, it, Community building, well, first, I think generally, you have to have a product or a service that people like. Without that, you really don't have much to build on. But there's so many great ways to foster a sense of community. Once you have those initial advocates, really, for any of you out there, you probably have people who are big fans of what you do or have said, like, hey, I want to be more involved. Mm -hmm. These are the people to start with. For me, when I was first building Asana's community, the first thing I did was talk to people like this and say, hey, we're thinking of putting something together, what would you like to see? What would be of value to you? It's really tough to go in and say, we're building this because this is what we want to get out of it. Like, wrong way to start. The right way to start is to ask people what will make it worth their while, especially in the context of what we're talking about. For me, especially as a, a B2B marketer, we're asking people to take time away from their already busy jobs and work to participate in a community program that if it doesn't have value for them, they're not coming back. So really getting clear on what I can create for them based on what they told me, and then mapping that to what does the business want and need from this community program? What is it trying to get? Is it more customer stories? Is it advocating on social media? Is it people showing up at events so they might have a chance to talk to sales or CS? What is it that's the nut of what the business is trying to get? And then I have to map those two things together. Here's what people want. Here's what the business needs. What program can we create that's at the intersection of those two things? Once you have that in mind, then it's easy to start doing experiments. Maybe you launch a Discord community or a Slack community and start seeding it with initial content so that people start to feel like this is what this community is about. You don't have to have the whole thing mapped out in advance in order to start experimenting and just get things off the ground to get some initial feedback from people who would be in your target. And from your point of view, Alison, what about scaling globally oh. and running a global program? Yeah. Making sure that you know, the authentic nature of the stories that you're telling hits the right notes in local markets, but coming at it from a global perspective. Totally. I'm just going to build, too, real quick off what both of you have said, because I think when you talked about super fans and starting there, so important, right? You have these like, passionate customers that want to tell their story, and there's nothing worse than partnering with a super fan and then he hearing your executives or maybe your stakeholders say, oh, I want, I want C-suite or actually I don't want that persona. And it's like, no, you, you actually want to start here. This is your super fan. Here's someone that's going to give you like organic, genuine content. Like that's how you establish trust, right? You build your programs around these people that are really vocal, that want to share their stories. And in turn, they build their careers and they bring more people along. That is so powerful in customer marketing and just like a great foundation. 
And then I think to further your point of like scaling globally, one of our opportunities is that we have a team in APJ and we have a team in EMEA, but we're really different businesses. We all report, like the whole customer marketing team, we report together, but we have such different KPIs, the way the sales cycle, it's very different, the brand awareness that we have. We recently did a, a, an event in Tokyo and you know we had subtitles and our CEO you know, was speaking, but everyone was listening in Japanese. And it's such a different experience than Octane, which is next week if you want to register. And you know, we have just such different brand awareness. And so when we started looking at our customer marketing team, we want to build customer trust. We want to find these super fans. We want to build content that's going to resonate. But the video that we're going to create for a, an enterprise B2B retail company versus JCB Bank in Tokyo, sorry, really in that microphone, is so different. So it's we work with distillery a lot, which is great. And we focus, we do focus groups, we do listening tours, we meet with our stakeholders to understand what content is gonna resonate in market. What are our AEs? What do they actually want? What will they actually use? What are our customers comfortable with? Like talking about customers not doing references. In Japan, it's such a different business model. So we wanna be really, um, mindful of like who they are and what feels comfortable to them and then distribute out content that's actually going to be used that we can actually measure so you can go back to our stakeholders and and share like what's performing and what's not performing i mean i could talk about this obviously for hours it's such a fun and beautiful thing to work on and it's there's always so many interesting things you can extrapolate from the data um but just you know building that out globally is so important and listening to your stakeholders and editing your plans um, to really reflect what your users need and what your customers want is really important. Mm -hmm. And Andres, we were talking about before, so one of the things that both of you have talked about is these, these super fans. And what's really interesting from our point of view as a, as a content company, when uh, an organization f uh, finds and is leveraging a super fan and is leading on them so hard that all of a sudden, all you see is that logo everywhere for about six months. Yeah. Andres, you had a point around how not to sweat too hard on that, that uh, super fan and the, the approach that Ultrix was taking um, to find those other uh, customer advocates to build trust. Yeah, um, I would consider ourselves very fortunate in terms of, you know, if, if we are in the marketing org, we're one of the very few functions that are truly customer facing. Um, and in my mind, we're the envy of the rest of the marketing org. So people are always coming to us and asking like, hey, do you have a customer that can you know, speak to XYZ topic? Or do you have a customer that fits this model? And you know, all they, get, they just got to ask and you know, building these relationships with these customers, like you know off the top of your head, like, yeah, I know this person. Yeah, this person would be great. Um, and at the same time, you know, we are also the gatekeepers, right? So we got to protect our customers just as much as the customer success reps or, you know, customer success managers and the sales reps do. Um, because you, <laughs> we've probably all fallen victim to this at one point or another is we produce this incredible case study with this, you know, Fortune 500 logo. And then all of a sudden, everybody wants a piece of that customer. And so you, you got to manage expectations and, you know, really protect the customer from getting pulled in all different directions to avoid that burnout, but also knowing the different customers in the back of your mind and knowing their stories, you can say, hey, let's, let's cool off on, you know, let's cool off on Bank of America for a second, and I got this other customer who can, who can knock it out of the park, and they have just as great of a story, and as a company, it, in my mind, it looks better because you have more breadth and depth of your, in your advocates and the storytelling versus just using the same advocate over and over and over. And then people start to wonder, like, well, is that all they got? You know? <laughs> I would add also, this is where having different altitudes of personas at a given company comes in really helpful. So when you have a salesperson requesting more from B of A, you can have the VP and the exec, the decision maker, but then you can have multiple advocates at different levels within the org who can speak to different things that all ladder up to the value that the customer is getting. That way you're not always leaning on the same person over and over and over, but if that particular logo is very important, yeah. broadening the base of people within it, especially down at the end user level, can be really valuable because they can speak to the day-to-day -day mm -hmm. while the exec is speaking to the high-level business outcome. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, do you have any builds there, Alison? You're nodding along. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the clock. I'm like, I could just do that all day long. But I mean, no, absolutely. I think, too, as, as the brands, like customer fatigue is so real. 
I, it's like you have to, and as a customer marketer, like right now for Octane, I'm like bullish in like no more additional requests because like they don't work for us. You had mentioned that earlier, like yeah. they're our customer, but they have a full-time job and you know, you want to elevate them. You don't want to elevate them too much where they get a new job in six months, you know? That's kind of common too, mm -hmm. right? Like, ooh, you're shining too bright. It's a little nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. A lot of my hero signage doesn't work anymore. But um, yeah, how do you protect them and build their brand, but don't get them promoted too quickly and look out for them? And it's a balance. And it's, I think with customer marketing, you sit at this really powerful place where you're listening to the business, you're making decisions based off what's gonna advance the company or help reach your company goals, but then you're also looking out for your customer. You understand like, am I looking, are they looking to drive brand awareness? Do they wanna brand, build their own brand? Are they looking to like skill up and maybe expand their team and expand their scope and how can you help them? I find like, we talked about customer advisory boards, like getting product knowledge is really important to customers. So it's like you have so many tools in your bag or tips and tricks and you wanna connect everyone and make everyone happy, but you have to just think of, there's just so much data coming at you. You have to be so strategic in that, so. Yeah, this is where there's a big difference between this type of marketing that's very people-based versus what I think of as the rest of marketing, which is very like activity-based. Like we send something out, but yeah. there's no human there. We, we get a click or we get data back, but we yeah. talk to people and it's very different. The mindset is very different. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, that people element is, is so integral to, to, to all of this and, and to, to building trust. And I think, you know, in, in the B2B marketing space, what, and I'm sure I'm not alone here, it's not, business to boring, like, like let's, we're talking to humans, right? Like, let's make content, great content about human stories that are, uh, you know, really resonating with other humans and understanding what makes your customer tick, but, you know, where is that, you know, supposed to be resonating? How, how is that supposed to be landing? And Josh, I wanted to ask you about the difference between, you know, from your point of view, community building, trust, and B2B versus B2C. Yeah, as it turns out, both similar and very different. So like I'd mentioned in my intro, I've, I'm at Asana and I also worked at Evernote and I've also done community building and nonprofit. At the bottom of it, everyone wants to feel like they're part of something. They want to be motivated to participate. They want activities that are interesting to them to do, to spend their time on. Where things get really different between B2C and B2B in particular is the context. So in B2B, they're usually trying to solve a problem or use a tool because of their work. They're trying to do something more efficiently at work or fix something that isn't working. And that's what led them to use whatever your offering is. So it's a different mindset than B2C, where often the core value is, I like this. I enjoy this. It's for fun. So the mindset is the most important thing to keep in mind because the context is really different. So when you're creating community for one of these two groups of people, you have to think about from their perspective, if it's for fun, like what would make them have even more fun? What would make them enjoy whatever you offer even more versus in a work context in B2B, what information can I give them that would solve one of their common points of pain? How can I show them how to use our tool and connect with other people who are doing it in a similar way that solves a problem for them? So it, it's similar in that the activities, the types of programmatic things you'll put together would look more similar than different, but the mindset and what the activities are inside of them can be quite different and varied. But like, I, I like to build B2B communities that have a B2C ethos, yeah. because I think even at work, people like to enjoy themselves. Surprise! <laughs> and so a lot of the activities that we do in our program are really for people to not just talk about Asana itself, but we provide a, a foundation where they can also meet other people to enjoy themselves. And Elson, I know when we were talking earlier about this, yeah. <laughs> you had a piece around your own personal experience. Oh, yeah, the Nordstrom effect. I mean, I don't think we go to work to your point and want to be bored, right? We yeah. want to like make it fun and exciting, but we also need it to be authentic. So I think about TikTok a lot too. So I know a lot of enterprise companies are like, let's get on TikTok. And it's like, oh, okay, but is that where your audience is? Is that like, if I'm like zoning out at the end of the day, do I want to be learning about identity on a TikTok? Probably not, you know? Maybe. But what I want to hear from another customer what I want to hear from someone that's like had success or or um, I don't know been able to like redefine their career by learning something new like yes yeah I would like that or swipe up or I don't know so I think like the b2c world is so fascinating because we have 
we, we don't want to live two separate lives. So I want to be influenced by what is going on. So I love like the Nordstrom experience. I love how easy the app is. I love how it's personalized to me. I love how they know exactly who I am and I can return whenever I want. And so I want to take all that goodness from the B2C life and put it into my B2B programs. And I want like my team to like raise up things that are happening in their personal life that they love. I want to take all the goodness from our everyday life and merge it into the corporate world so we're not beta boring and then we're having a good time and we're learning off that. So it's, it's always a fine balance of like, this is great, will it translate to the B2B world? Yes, I just need to find that hook into why so I'm not watching weird TikToks. Or, or I, I possibly am. So there's that. I, I wanted to ask about the makeup of the organizations that um, that you guys sit in, what the customer marketing function, where, where it sits even. You know, at Distillery, we work with a number of different organizations and it always fascinates me where customer marketing sits, where they're plugged into, where they're reporting to, who's giving feedback on our content. And I think there are some, you know, some real skills mm -hmm. uh, in customer marketing. Like it's a, it's a really sp specialist skill set that not a lot of organizations do very well. Yeah. And Alison, you know, yeah. from your point of view, what makes a great uh, customer marketing specialist? Well, we are currently hiring for two customer marketing managers, if anyone's interested. And I think to your point, like the skills that we're looking for with a customer marketer are great communicator, a great collaborator, because you truly are like a Swiss army knife or a secret weapon. You want product feedback, you want to meet with executives, like you had mentioned earlier, like, I got someone. Like there's, I never go into a conversation without having like three customers in my back pocket. So I'm not disagreeing with what someone else is saying, but so-and-so at such and such, they actually feel that this would be a stronger point of view. So I think it's a really nice balance um, of just having a strategic mindset, again, communicating, because you're taking all of this feedback and you're deciphering it and you're putting it through this customer marketing or community funnel. Um, and then you're, you're trying to actively portray them. So that's really important. And then um, I think having a really good sense of humor because it's a little exhausting sometimes trying to make everyone happy and that is uh, not easy to come by. So I think uh, I would just say, I think there, I've heard a lot of laughs. I've heard all the sessions here have been great and um, building off each other. And I think that's just reflective of the great culture that customer marketing teams can build. Yeah, can build. Yeah. Yeah. Andreas, what about uh, from your point of view and how customer marketing is uh, set up at Ultrix? And also, we, we, when we were talking earlier over a coffee, you were talking about some of the key skills in terms of communication and relationship building and also really un understanding and aligning where your customers are heading. Yeah, so... Um, yeah. Part of what I mentioned earlier is, you know, we, we want to protect the customers, right? But at the same time, we also want to understand what are their goals, you know, what are they trying to do? Um, and also trying to partner with our, our account team. So like our, um, you know, the sales team, the account executives, the customer success managers. And so, you know, really once we've built that trust with the, with the advocate, and we understand what they're trying to do. And in a lot of cases, they, they want to evangelize internally to their uh, organizations. They want to bring in, uh, in, our, in our case, they want to bring in more Alteryx product. And so we try to help identify opportunities to bring in you know, awareness days, whether that's um, creating special internal only content for them or, having a, or organizing a, an internal awareness event um, that'll drive awareness for that account and help potentially bring in more business. And Josh, what about where community sits? Yeah, so at Asana, I sit within marketing, so community is a pillar within marketing. Customer advocacy actually sits within brand and content, which is a pillar within marketing. So it's interesting to me hearing all the different ways that these things are situated. As it relates to community, just show of hands, how many have a community program at your organization? Okay, and how many for you is it a team of one? Yeah, so this is interesting to me because I've watched the evolution of community programs over the years, and community as it stands today is actually very similar to where customer success was maybe 10 years or so ago, where if you had a customer success org, you were really at the forefront of what it was like to be in SaaS, 
and it was this weird thing that was in between sales and support and what do they really do and is it really needed? I think that's where a community is right now where some companies have it sitting in support, which is traditionally where it lived because it was meant as a way to deflect tickets. Others have it sit within sales as a way to drive pipeline, which is not my recommended spot to put it. For others, it sits within CX as part of the entire post-sale customer journey. And then for others, it sits within marketing because it's looked at as a channel. There is no right answer yet as to where this should sit. It really just depends on what the goals of the org are and how it's going to be resourced. But sadly, most of the teams that I speak with, it's still a community program of one person or two people. There's a lot that can be done with community when it's properly resourced and when it's set up to be successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. I think we might uh, throw to some questions uh, from the audience. Are you ready for some questions? Great. I'll, uh, let's have a look up here. Uh, Josh, how does Asana manage relationships and tools at scale for the community events, forum, and ambassador programs? I love that you assume that we do that. Uh, <laughs> but the good news is we do. We've given it a lot of thought. And so I don't know how many of you stopped by the common room booth, but we are actually a customer of theirs. And uh, I don't work for them. I'm not paid by them. But you need a tool that helps aggregate everything that's happening within the community that happens to be one of the tools. There's another one, Threado. There are a few that do this. But you really need a way to look across the breadth of your community program to see who's really active, who needs a little bit of help, where they're active, which channels, what they're doing. Because without that, it's actually really difficult and exceedingly manual to keep track of all of the channels that you might have within your community program and try to map what you're doing to each person in each channel. And we have 400,000 people in our community program. I have a team of like a dozen people. There's no way to just do all of that manually. So having a tool that helps you do this at scale is really, really important. And that's how we do it. Great. Another question. You're wow, you're popular, you're uh, Josh. Yeah. I feel so popular. Yeah. This is great. <laughs> Um, uh, this is uh, uh, following on from your response about tiers of advocate personas. How do you priori prioritize which tier of an org and stories to target with your advocacy strategy? So that's a good question, and it really depends on what the business is asking for. So my team's main job is to cultivate whoever comes to us at whichever level in an org they happen to be. Oftentimes, it's at the team lead and IC level. Great. We love people who are actively using the product. Sometimes it's people who are at a more executive level. We want them to use the product too, as it turns out. When it comes time to pull a customer story or identify a customer that could be a really great advocate for us, we use our analytics tool, Common Room, to identify who within an org is really, really active. And where do we have potential inroads to have a, a more in-depth conversation with a person or multiple people? So then we can see if this person is ready to have their story told or participate with us on stage or something like that. But we don't assume that they're ready because as all of you know, if you work in customer marketing, not everyone wants to do all of the things all the time. Yeah. So we, we use the data that we have to identify who can we help cultivate to get them further along this path. Yeah. Can I just add to, your, to this as well? I think what's interesting in, in my world is we have community that sits within our support organization. It's very, and it's support cases. It's truly like, I cannot log in. It is someone technical, it's a developer. That is not an ambassador. They could be a super fan and that's a separate conversation, but our, we have a community that sits there. Then we have an influitive community where we are targeting um, C-suite personas and, and marketing. And that's where we do a lot of our focus groups. We're moving our cab into that community. So we're, ha we're now building two separate communities with two very different needs and very different KPIs that we're trying to explain to leadership, but they're like, it's community. And it's like, well, this is support, but it is a support community and they're different KPIs. So that's really interesting too, because while you know, we have a very curated experience and we're able to pull like, really great data because we built that community with the sense of building our pipeline, getting product feedback, getting press engagements, understanding what third parties are top of mind, which is very different than case resolution and escalations and things like that. So I think too, as you think about the tiers of advocates in your community, really establishing what is the purpose of that community, how are you measuring success and setting that up front is so critical or else you'll have leaders ask you, to make both communities align, and that's just never going to happen. And that's okay, but they're so different. 
And what about the role of content in those communities? Oh, totally. It's huge. I mean, you. I'll let you go first, but I mean, oh, <laughs> after you, after you. Um, <clears throat> you know, we get so much great insight from our customers in, in the community. So we we do a lot of focus groups. I know you'd mentioned that earlier of like, what is top of mind? Like AI is really hot right now. And our customers are always asking us like, what is your stance on it? And we're like, well, what, what's your stance? Like, how do you define it? What are you thinking of what's top of mind? And so from there, um, we get a lot of great insights that we infuse throughout our like um, thought leadership content. And then we also use our community as a, as, a, as a fishing environment of like who wants to tell their story, who's ready to like raise their hand and share their story and get on stage or do a case study. So we kind of use it as both, one, to pressure test topics that are top of mind for us and infuse that throughout our content, and then two, to use it as a, a recruitment tool to understand who's ready to, to throw it over to distillery for a customer story. <laughs> awesome. I... So you want to add Would you, to you like to build on that, Josh? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask each of you, actually, um, you know, we're all talking about trust, but I'd like to ask each of you what your definition of trust is. It was pointed just towards you, know, Alison, but I've thrown no, it to I feel everyone like to uh, you, help you out. You, you've heard from us. Come on, we're, we're going to throw this to you. Yeah, oh, man, we're getting real <laughs> intimate, aren't we? <laughs> Dang. <sighs> you don't want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> what about the definition of trust for your organization? Definition of trust for our organization. I, I can't really, I can't really define it. It's just, uh, I guess I can give an example of just it, the jail example I gave. So we have multiple advocates. To you know, to your point earlier, you have different tiers of advocates, but one of our main advocates, you know, she absolutely loves us. I was texting with her this morning. Um, but anytime we need anything from her, like she's, she's on it right away. Um, you know, any sort of speaking engagements, any sort of reference calls. But in return though, like we, you know, she's all over the place. Like she's in our corporate decks. She's, uh, she was on our digital billboard the week of our global conference. Um, but we can also go to her and, you know, if she ever feels like it's too much, like she can always just, lift, hey, like can't do this this time. Like, so there, it, it's just more of a, it, it's a give and take, I guess I would say. Great. I'm throwing you under the bus, Josh. I mean, for me, I think it's pretty simple. It's we tell people what we're going to do and then we do that thing. And when you don't do that, that's when you break the trust. It doesn't mean that you need to be super transparent with everybody all the time about all the things, but I, I think it's actually really important with people, like for instance, our ambassador community, they're all under NDA. We give them a, an advance preview of what's going to be happening in the product. We equip them with talking points, so if people in their orgs or in their community have questions. So I think it's really fostering this sense of, we're gonna tell you what's going on. We want you to know who we are as people, and who we are as a company and why we do the things that we do. I don't think you can fake trust. I think you have to earn it. Yeah. And it takes work to make that happen, especially when you're talking about doing it in communities of scale. But for me, I think the most real way to do that is by telling people what's going on. They want to know. Your customers are paying you. They have a right to know to an extent. Uh, you can't tell them everything all the time, but what you can share with them, share it. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you your definition of trust too, just so you know. <clears throat> we're going to put, we're going to go all the way down the line. Um, but I think so. I, my daughter is four years old, and I've been trying to explain concepts to her. Intuition is one we're we're trying to describe. But I think with trust, it's like building off what both of you said. That feeling of of a customer knowing that like I've got their back and that I will represent them the best way possible. So like their face won't show up on a billboard without their approval, which can happen and is was why I would never let anyone take my photo because I never want to see it anywhere. Um, I think exactly it's have, like sticking to your word and being honest and agreed. It doesn't mean over communicating and being too, too transparent, but just having their back, supporting them and knowing that at the end of the day, both of you feel good because of that relationship you've established and, and and that authentic connection of listening, hearing, and doing the right thing for one another. It's just so, so critical and hard, but important to do. Now, Steve, what is, what is your definition of trust? I think for me, when I've seen organizations struggle with trust, it's when 
um, there hasn't been great communication with the customer, and the story's not told authentically. The, it, it hasn't been crafted, it hasn't been told in the right way, it's been sort of shoved out there, a logo's been stuck somewhere, and there's no real purpose for it. It's a, it's a little bit tick boxy. Yeah. You know, someone somewhere has requested this and it's just being done, rather than really taking someone, someone on, a, on a journey. And I think I was talking to um, another one of our, our clients the other, uh, the other day, and he was talking all about how he loves hearing the critical comments on social media, because from their customers, it's, that's where he's learning. That's where he's really plugging into what people think, what people want, and reaching out to them, talking to them. And I, th I think that's a really great way of, of, of building trust. I want to uh, throw to you, uh, Josh, around um, another question. Uh, when does it make sense to add in more critical voices to ensure your community is truly authentic? So here's the good news. You don't have to add them. They're going to come to you. <laughs> so I, I think it's important to have a space where people can have open and honest conversations. As it turns out, as a business, sometimes you're going to do things that people don't like. That doesn't mean don't do them. It means you should be able to explain them and talk about why you've made decisions that you've made. And I think it's actually quite important to offer the space for people to offer contrary opinions, as long as it's done in a, a polite way that feels good for everyone who's participating in the conversation. I don't think it's a good idea to, especially executives don't really understand this. They want every single comment to be positive. Right. That is not reality. And I would rather people have feelings about what we're doing rather than not feel anything at all and not say anything at all. And being able to explain, okay, well, here's a launch that's coming up. We know that people may have some strong feelings in different directions about this. Here's our mitigation plan, but we should expect that people are going to post about this because they care. When you can explain it that way and explain that you have ways that you're going to help address the narrative, usually that for me has been fine, but you don't have to worry about inviting those voices in. They will find you. <laughs> just make sure that you have a plan for how to address them. Can I just add to this? I agree, you'll find them. But I also think we're sometimes responsible for making sure that we're finding communities that aren't naturally finding their way into our marketing plans. And I will say, my dad growing up was in a wheelchair, and it's really important for me to show people with disabilities in our marketing assets. Because I remember being a little girl and being really confused why people were staring at us all the time, and it's because they didn't live with someone in a wheelchair. I was like, what, wait, you've never seen this before? It's totally normal. So I think there are times where like, that, like your veterans, your veteran community, your people of color, women, like it's really important to look at the data of your community and is it really reflective of the world that we live in and what can you do to help influence that? Maybe, you know, um, with our customer base often, we can be asked to diversify our customers, but is our customer base diverse? That is the real question. It is not me swapping out customers to tell a story that doesn't exist. It should, I need to pull from a community that exists today. And if it doesn't exist today, what can we do as a company? It is not my job as a customer marketer to make people feel better about the faces on a screen. It's a company value of how do we get the right people a seat at the table? So then to your point, they're in the community, that their voice is showing up. And that is, we partner a lot with our diversity and inclusion, our Office of Diversity and Inclusion to make sure sure that we're not just checking a box, but that we're living our values because th that's really important. And you've got to really look at the data and, and yeah, it sometimes to your point, it is negative mm -hmm. and the voices aren't being heard. And it's, it's a big burden to carry, but as a customer marketer, when you're looking at the data, um, it's really, I think, important to do that. Just because the voices can be hard to hear doesn't make them not valid. Yeah. And I think we've got time for one last question. And speaking of data, uh, Robert, uh, there you are. I had some really great um, uh, ideas on this on this this morning. But I also want to ask you guys around, as a discipline, do you think we're good at articulating the value that we create for our organisations? Oh man, it could be better. I think customer marketing in general is so exciting and we're at the forefront. Like when you were talking about customer success 10 years ago, like customer marketing is still um, undefined in many ways, which makes it exciting and fun. But my customer or marketing organization is very different from your organi organization and yours. And so our KPIs and data aren't aligned. And so I think we can do a better job. I think 
events like this where you come together and you share best practices and you can connect and talk through your marketing plans will be great. I think, you know, with product marketing, there's like very um, distinct disciplines. So I think customer marketing is still building that. And so we're at a really exciting time to be here, but I think it could be better. But there's so many great stories around the data that I know companies are telling and I love learning about it. But I think we're still um, getting stronger as a, as a marketing discipline. Any builds there? Yeah, I, I would just, I, I want to piggyback off of it. I, I agree that we could be better. I think a lot of times um, we get stuck in the same metrics that we've been reporting on for the last five to 10 years, which is you know, productivity. How many cases did we put out? How many reference calls did we assist with? You know, all the same stuff that we've been reporting on for the last five to 10 years. And there have been a few people that have actually, you know, kind of broke the ceiling or gone, you know, gone past the glass ceiling and have actually done something really cool. And it's, I think it's our responsibility to share with one another. Um, you know, Robert, you had your talk earlier and you shared some of your stuff, like that's, that's gonna help other people. And you know, I, I'm more than happy to share, you know, what I know. And I, I think that's, that's only gonna help each other with our own uh, KPIs and metrics and showing that we can bring value back to the business that's tangible dollars versus just productivity based. Amazing. Well, I think we're out of time, and I think that's a, it's a great place to, to wrap up. Thank you so much for, for your thoughts. Thanks. Thank you for your questions, everyone. Thank you. Thanks again.